I doubt on this son. It helps. I know. When I entered the early double digits of my weary existence, I was struck by a very special piece of cinema. 1997 Starship Troopers is a film I cherish more than any other. I'm not saying I think it's the best or most important movie ever made, but it is my favourite. I didn't pay any attention to the sequels or spin-offs, because I'd never felt the need to dilute perfection. If I wanted more, I could just watch it again. If I needed additional exotic takes on space marines and questionable politics, I'd reread The Forever War. Then I made a dumb promise to our Patreons. I said if Inframeout hit 10,000 subscribers, I'd do a deep dive into each and every one of these unwanted afterthoughts. Flawless victory. But before I could get started with my race to the bottom of the barrel, my friend Drew, aka the conflicted weeb and man with a nice shirt from over at Select Screen, made damn sure I carved out some time to discuss the very first stab at translating Robert A. Heinlein's novel into the moving image. Strap in, folks, because things are about to get very anime indeed. Nine whole years before Paul Verhoeven gave birth to his beautiful fascist baby, Japan was channeling Johnny Rico's Aryan energy into a cheap and disconcertingly cheerful OVA based on Heinlein's source material. With the most popular visual interpretation still a ways off, director Tetsuro Amino and his team of animators were tasked with giving life and commercial appeal to a novel famously low on levity and high on incredibly uncomfortable xenophobic overtones. They did this in just about the most 80s anime way possible. Cue wildly inappropriate pop rock bangers over what is ostensibly a dewy eyed ode to steel toed militarism. There's also a conscientious effort to de emphasize the blood and guts, opting instead for a fairly standard tale of young men being honed into hardened soldiers while they pine for their hometown sweethearts. The bugs are unrecognisable compared to later takes on their monstrous forms, here more closely resembling aquatic abominations and janky jellyfish, while all of this is rendered with the kind of frame skipping, shot looping, panning a still image to simulate movement animation that plagues low budget offerings of the format. There's plenty to knowingly nod along to if you're a fan of the novel or the 1997 theatrical release, with several scenes playing out almost identically. Although now we're treated to Rico getting belted in the face by his mother, which is so satisfying it should retroactively be added into every version of this story. Relatively unknown in the Western world and relegated to rare laser discs and handy bootlegs, it wasn't until the chef's kiss marvel of this flawless thing of beauty that most of us got to bask in the nuclear glow of awful people. But as I've already said, we're not here to talk in depth about this cultural colossus. No, this is all about the day late and a dollar short brain sucking also ran sequels that tried their darndest to sully the succulent glory of the mobile infantry, with the exception of one honourable mention. Earth to Rico, come in please. Oh, sorry, did you say something? Chronicling the ongoing exploits of Johnny Rico and his gung ho regimen of bug stomping stormtroopers, Roughnecks offers a surprisingly robust look into the tech, creatures, lore, and characters of the Starship Troopers universe. Some of its own invention, a few pulled right out of the novel, and some chopped and screwed elements from young adult fare like Ender's Game and Transformers. Following multiple campaigns and overarching threads, the plotting and voice acting is a step above what you might expect, and there's a serialised continuity from week to week that nurtures a real investment in these garishly rendered jarheads. It's commendable to see a show explicitly formatted for children's TV that refuses to pander or talk down to a younger audience. When the mobile infantry wiped out that nasty bug infestation threatening our research stations on Pluto, enlisting was no longer just patriotic. It was cool. Which, amongst other reasons, may be why this never caught on as it should. 
marred with production delays, scheduling conflicts, and no bid to capitalise on the lucrative potential for toys or tie-ins, Roughnecks was cancelled before it could even finish out its first season. Nowadays, the biggest barrier to entry is its availability, as it's relegated to low-definition DVD releases, as well as the fact that, well, it's very much a product of its era. Which is a kind way of saying it looks extremely rough by modern standards. Still, if you can get through its outdated shell, there's a lot here to admire. Which is a hell of a lot more than I can say for what's coming next. <sighs> On a random Dust Bowl planet, a squadron of Federation soldiers is forced to hunker down and wait out an ever-expanding swarm of arachnids. One by one, they're infected and killed off by a new breed of mind-controlling bug. Right off the bat, it's readily apparent this shabby and wholly unnecessary sequel is a no-budget affair. While it cost just 5% of the original's budget to produce, any money at all that went into Hero of the Federation feels completely wasted. The establishing shots are a jarring blend of shamelessly reused moments from the original film, which was shot on pristine 35mm Kodak film. Here those images are carelessly interspersed with new footage captured on low-quality digital tape. It's like cutting between a work of art and an overflowing outhouse, and begging the audience not to spot the difference. Once things settle into their terrible groove, the sweeping downgrades to everything you'd associate with Starship Troopers start to feel like an escalating toothache. After an opening skirmish that takes place on what looks like a mound of dirt in someone's backyard, we scurry along to some chest-high walls, where most of the already limited cast are immediately killed off by a gust of wind because extras and actors cost money. From here on out, the rest of the film takes place almost exclusively in a dingy bunker, absent any hint of colour, personality, or production value. The once intimidating assault weapons are here replaced with plastic toy rifles, spruced up with blinking flashlights on the end of their barrels, to simulate muzzle flare. What little action there is is distorted with excessive, unmotivated shaky cam, and a ludicrous over-reliance on character close-ups in a failed attempt at masking the minuscule sets. So, how do you go about adding atmosphere to these generic dusty corridors? I don't know. Hero of the Federation's answer is to ask the gaffer to shine a floodlight directly into the actor's eyes. But why? In a truly baffling piece of casting, actor Brenda Strong returns, having played Captain Deladere in the original. Only now she's Sergeant Rake, a completely unrelated character in the supposedly canonical sequel whose most memorable characteristic is that she has a tattoo that appears to have been drawn on with a sharpie. It may look bad, but if that's the worst you suffer, then that's fine. I won't quit. All of these shortcuts, infantile decisions, and budgetary compromises would be more adorably garbage if this wasn't a follow-up to a film that still feels technically impressive after more than 20 years. Which makes a quick glance at the crew behind this all the more shocking. This was written by Edward Neumeyer, the same man who had previously given us screenplays for Robocop and Starship Troopers, and it was directed by visual effects genius and Jurassic Park dinosaur supervisor Phil Tippett but you'd be forgiven for thinking this entire thing was made up on the fly, based on whatever props and sets they could get their hands on. Remember this small but wonderful scene from the original? They sucked his brains out. Hero of the Federation is that, but stretched out to 90 minutes long, in a disaster that begs the question, what if we dug up John Carpenter's The Thing and lathered its sticky skeleton in earwax? It is completely lacking in satire, allegorical edge, or even the faintest facade that anyone involved gave a fuck. Look how they mask with my boy. Hero of the Federation is the worst thing to ever besmirch the Starship Troopers brand. Attempting to recall what happened mere moments after the credits roll is like scrambling to remember a nightmare you had in the womb. Thankfully, nothing that followed this was quite as bad, but don't get me wrong. They are not good. I mean, you do know that, don't you? Wow. 
11 years after the taking of Planet P, Johnny Rico and the United Citizen Federation are ensnared in trench warfare with the Arachnids. All the while, religious fervour and political double dealings threaten to shatter the very foundations of the mobile infantry. From the opening salvo of the Federal News Network, I knew that no matter what, Marauder was going to be significantly better than the shrapnel enema provided by Hero of the Federation. The cheeky satirical bite returns, with references to Oppenheimer, the mass execution of conscientious objectors, and a pro-war pop song called A Good Day to Die that bangs way harder than it has any right to. Written once again by Edward Neumeyer, who's also taken his seat in the director's chair, we're firmly back to the tongue-in-cheek territory of piss-taking totalitarianism and eroded civil liberties. Unfortunately, this time it's largely an unfocused bombardment of ideological groaners, rather than a surgical strike of insightful wit. With the main target this time around being religion, Marauder never quite settles on which side it's trying to skewer. Which leads to all the characters being divided into annoying zealots or irritating atheists. I believe. I know you do, Holly. Your faith is clear and serene. Even if the idea of making the arachnid god a vagina-mouthed cockroach is hilarious in theory, the first film has a more pertinent, provocative gag at the expense of god-fearing futility, and it does so with far greater effect in just a matter of seconds. Mormon extremists disregarded federal warnings and established Port Joe Smith, deep inside the arachnid quarantine zone. Too late, they realized that Dantana had already been chosen by other colonists, arachnids. Would you like to know more? I could at least forgive the lack of intellectual layers here if it made good with some audacious fun, but out with a few laughs and some welcome splatter, it's frightfully dull and ugly as all sin. To be fair, the cinematography and fluid purposeful camera movements are a night and day difference from the sex tape looking shoddiness of Hero of the Federation, but beyond these most minor of victories, Marauder is not a pretty picture. Some of the CGI is the worst I've ever stomached, regardless of budgetary constraints, the brain bug now looks like a papier-mâché testicle, and much of it has the air of a creaky soundstage in need of some painterly detail. When the titular Marauder battle mechs finally make their series debut, it's with a whimper, barely lasting four minutes, and executed like a less charming version of Robot Jocks. I'd have thought some of this tedium would be alleviated by the sight of Casper Van Dien back in action and still unaware that his very casting was kind of a joke. After all, in 1997, Van Dien's soapy, hopelessly earnest performance was only there to bolster the feeling that we're watching an in-universe propaganda film. In Marauder, Neumeyer's direction never reconciles the purposefully campy with its toothless staging leaving every line from Rico's mouth a wooden clunker destined to fall on tin ears. What are you people talking about? While the supporting cast spit out their words like broken teeth. What do you think of them, Lieutenant? Buds? I hate them, sir. And because this is one of the few things I'm okay with being pedantic about, folks keep calling Rico the hero of Planet P, even though he's absolutely not was a drill instructor named Zim who captured a brain. Show some goddamn respect for Zim, you fucking <laughs> Anywho, Starship Troopers 3 Marauder goes to show that you can be a noticeable improvement and brimming with ideas, but still shart your civvies when you step up to the plate. From here on out we bid farewell to live action for the infinite wasted opportunities of computer-generated animation. Ah, oh, come on. I didn't have anything to do with any of this. I'm just the damn janitor trying to clean it up. After an arachnid attack on a Federation space station, a squad of elite soldiers are sent in to clear up the mess. With the help of series veterans Rico and Ibanez, the race is on to uncover the bug's intentions. While that plot synopsis may sound thin, you wouldn't know it from the disjointed, convoluted manner in which it unfolds. 
scenes overstay their welcome or abruptly end before we're whisked off somewhere else, without so much as a contextual tip of the cap as to where we're going or why. There was only so much scrambled egg storytelling I could take before I zoned out to the point that I started noticing spelling errors all over the place. Satellite anyone? Brooklyn? The low-hanging fruit. On a more serious and far less forgivable note, Invasion is dumbfoundingly wrong-headed in how it chooses to depict women. You, uh, want me to show you the shower? I could wash her back. You don't want to wash my front? In the first 30 minutes, we're treated to multiple leering shots of computer-sculpted boobs in all their creepily out-of-place gratuitousness. Outside of these shudder-inducing scenes, objectification and waifish characterization are rife. Verhoeven understood that every member of the Federation fleet is equal regardless of gender, because in the eyes of this military, each grunt is just as expendable as the next. Even his brazenly corny version of a co-ed shower scene served as both a mockery of superfluous sexualization and a jab at how action cinema tries to sex up what is essentially an exposition dump. Starship Troopers' invasion just feels disgusting. All the while it drunkenly stumbles the line of at once wishing to be a gruff-voiced self-serious ode to the Starship Troopers novel, while wholesale lifting almost all the design elements from Verhoeven's movie. Now that isn't to say this doesn't bring any new stylistic choices to the table. It's just that they're all incomprehensible. The bugs here are perfectly capable of thriving in the freezing vacuum of space, the arachnid queen can apparently hack human computers with its mind, Rico has gone from looking like this, to a cross between Solid Snake and a roughed up Bible salesman, and Carmen's new appearance is that of a default creator character template that nobody bothered to customise. Then there's the most obvious change from the previous three films. Invasion is Starship Trooper's first feature-length offering to make the jump to animation, and it's certainly a leap forward in that regard, following the unkempt anime and lovable but aesthetically unpleasant Roughnecks, at least when it comes to inanimate objects and cosmic vistas. Once our heroes take off their helmets, however, the film falls headfirst into the uncanny valley, leaving only a mangled corpse of dead-eyed obliviousness on the canyon floor. It's another example of the all-too-common Final Fantasy The Spirits Within problem, where any effort to render human emotion registers like someone pumping too much air into a sex doll. These downright weird facial expressions only become more disconcerting when paired with voice acting that wouldn't feel out of place in a porn parody of a commercial for mood stabilizers. A bug invasion will not happen on my watch, sir. Ultimately, once you've scraped the small handful of interesting action beats off the heel of your boot, all that's left of Invasion is a stringy, icky mush of misguided ideas and narcoleptic narrative. Still, it was successful enough for director Shinji Aramaki to return for the fifth and to date final flog of this long dead horse. Are you dying on me? What? I said, are you dying on me, trooper? No. Demoted, relocated, and put in charge of training a fresh batch of meat for the grinder, Colonel Rico is tasked with uncovering a conspiracy that threatens not just the lives of everyone on Mars, but the integrity of the entire Federation. Third time's the charm for Casper Van Dien, the on-again, off-again lead of this wretch-inducing rodeo, as Traitor of Mars earns the distinction of being the best of a very bad bunch. <coughs> Whoa, don't get carried away now. It's the best in the same way that setting fire to your leg is preferable to plunging your head into bubbling magma. This is still the kind of film where bug plasma incinerates troops and rips starships in half, but doesn't so much as knock a strand of stubble off Johnny Rico's chin. Once again, the unblinking, rod-up-the-ass computer animation is back in all its unsettling awkwardness, though there is a marked improvement across the board in terms of fidelity and fluidity. 
That's until, for reasons unknown, they arbitrarily paste in some live action footage, in the same jarring manner in which they crammed a Fred Willard cameo into Wally. -E. The plot here is negligibly slight, acting more as cardboard packaging to deliver long absent fan favourites and brief flashes of muscular spectacle. But I have to admit my heart did flutter for a moment when I heard Dina Mayer back as the voice of Dizzy Flores. Diz? <laughs> I knew that would work. She's here in the form of a psychic astral projection that doesn't make a lick of sense, but she gives Traitor of Mars a much needed dose of warming nostalgia. It's in these moments of fan service and Saturday morning cartoonish stupidity where this instalment comes closest to finding a satisfying tempo. In particular, a drop sequence onto the surface of Mars is tremendously fun, suitably violent, and brimming with the piss and vinegar required to hack through the walls of shoddy shit this series has built around itself. Still, by the end, the bad categorically crushes the life out of the good, which goes to show even the most polished turd on the shelf is never going to compare favourably with a chocolatey treat. If I've learned anything from a lifetime of greeting card platitudes and subpar romantic comedies, it's that true love can overcome any obstacle. After hours upon hours of bastardizations and butchered cash grabs, the pedestal on which Starship Troopers has sat for over two decades has only grown loftier. By scalding my retinas with all the ways this story of humanity versus weird stab monsters can go wrong, it only served to further rose tint how Paul Verhoeven so expertly executed his vision the first time around. What should have been respectfully laid to rest after its only theatrical outing has instead been zombified and left to rot in the bargain bin. By acknowledging their presence, giving them a chance, and being in no way surprised at their shocking quality, I can go back to my fantasy land where this is all there is, and these apes don't want to live forever. The only good sequel's a dead sequel for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, Becky O, and Nicholas Lair Revere, and a nuke down the bug hole for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. Have you had any experience with the Starship Trooper sequels? Did you even know that the anime existed? And what are your general thoughts on all these films? Let us know down there in the comments, and let me know if you played any of the video games, which I always wanted to play but heard were pretty bad. Sound off down in the comments below, and please take a second to like, share, subscribe, and drop a comment. If you're in a position to do so, maybe click on the link to our Patreon in the description below, where you can get instant access to our film club, private Discord, and your name in the closing credits. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is In Frame Out.